Welcome to Get the Balance Right, a podcast for creative entrepreneurs who challenge the status quo. I'm your host, Heather Zeitzwolf, and I'm on a mission to help and inspire visionaries to grow their firms with a keen focus on their triple bottom line. Join me for conversations with purpose-driven leaders, business disruptors, CEOs, and renegades in digital media, marketing, advertising, and design. Hey everyone, this is Heather Zeitzwolf and you are listening to Get the Balance Right Podcast. On today's show, we are talking about the Enneagram. Yes, it's one of those personality tests, kind of like the Myers-Briggs or DISC, but the Enneagram is a little bit different. You've probably heard discussions about the Enneagram on other podcasts, but this discussion is way different from those. Rather than going into what the Enneagram is all about, instead, we talk about how you can use this information in your life and as an entrepreneur. To talk about this, we are joined by Leslie Lyons. She is the founder of the Bombshell Movement Studio in Chicago and the host of Beyond the Pole Tales from the CEO podcast. Have you ever looked at the Enneagram personality test? Well, I took my test the other day and discovered that I am Enneagram 8. Well, turns out Leslie Lyons is also an 8, and she's an Enneagram enthusiast. We get all nerdy about the Enneagram on this show, and we go into some really kind of raw places with this conversation. It gets kind of edgy at times, I must say. She is a trip. I actually got to know Leslie a little bit before recording this podcast. She was booked to be on this show a while back. Her and I ended up being in the same program together. Carol Cox from Speaking Your Brand has this thought leadership group. And I was like, wait, Leslie Lyons, she's booked to be on my show. Wait a minute. It's just so funny that the worlds collide in such interesting ways. I want to do a couple of shout outs. In the podcast, I mention a couple of people, but I don't mention them by name. When I talk about the marketer, I'm referring to Charlotte Chipperfield. She was a guest on my show, episode 17. And I also mention a bookkeeper, and that's Jesse Hornby from Nerds for Numbers. I will have both of their information in the show notes. All right. This is a really fun conversation, and I learned a new term, stacking and flipping it. All right, here's my fun conversation with Leslie Lyons. Leslie Lyons, welcome to my podcast. I'm so excited to have you on today. Heather, thank you so much for inviting me. You are so cool. Just in the time that I've gotten to know you through our groups that we're in together, I was excited to be on the seat because I think I was booked on your podcast before I met you. So I'm even more excited now that I actually know some stuff about you. It was a trip. I was like, Leslie Lyons, wait a minute. I know, wait a minute. She's going to be on my podcast. (laughs) I love it. Thank you so much for inviting me. We have a lot of fun things to unpack today about the Enneagram, but for the folks in the audience that don't know who you are, you have a a mini empire of businesses. Can you just explain to the audience who you are and maybe just go into a little bit about your businesses? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Leslie Lyons. My primary primary business is I own a central movement studio here in Chicago, where we help women reclaim their voice and power through movement. And I've owned that for 15 years. So it's a brick and mortar business. In the last three years, I made the shift into coaching other businesses that seek to empower woman folk, woman identifying folk. That could be anybody who owns a dance studio. It could be hairstylists, lash techs, It could be accountants, anybody who puts a focus on elevating the feminine and they have a brick and mortar business, I can help them put some systems in place to pull themselves away from the pack and make more money. Wow, that's awesome. And you do this partly with the Enneagram. Yes. Oh, okay. Before we dive into the Enneagram, I wanted to ask you a bit about some of the things I saw on your website. You have this in bold text, your voice and values matter. I really love this. Can you explain what that means to you? I always share a story about how I found my voice and how I lost my voice as a woman. I grew up in a supportive family. And more importantly, my dad was very supportive of my voice. I was four years old and I'll never forget. It's one of my first childhood memories of me not wanting to eat Brussels sprouts. (laughs) My mom grew up in the era of kids are seen, not heard. That's not what you do. You don't tell them no. That ain't how it goes down. 
But I was like, I'm not eating these Brussels sprouts. And she said, excuse me? I said, I don't want to eat them. And she was like, oh, you're going. And she was getting ready to go into a rant. And my father said, no, E. That's what he called my mom. He's like, no, E. She has a right to speak up. She doesn't want it. She can say she doesn't want it. Now, she's still going to eat it. (laughs) But she has a right to express her dismay. And that started me on a path of me thinking, good and bad, everybody needed to know what I had to say. But fast forward to when I was in my early 20s, trigger warning a little bit, I was in a domestic violence situation. All of my life, that voice of mine translated in society as being too much. And I was so in love with this guy, I was determined that I was going to shrink myself. And in shrinking myself, I shrunk my voice in an attempt to keep him. All those years of having a voice, but not necessarily being celebrated when I got in the real world for it, actually took a very confident young girl and turned her into a very insecure woman. After I got out of that relationship by God's grace, I started on a path to rediscovering something that I always had and that was nurtured. So voice matters. And you being a financial professional, I'm sure this will land for you as well. I also do work with sex trafficking organizations. And I can tell you, I've spoken, unfortunately, to many women who have been trafficked. And a lot of times we think trafficking is snatching you into vans and things of that nature. But a lot of modern day trafficking is trafficking of the psyche. Very similar to my situation. But here's the thing I found is that in addition to voice, they have no financial power. So they get stuck. So for me, in what I believe I've been called to do in this portion of my life is to mirror that. Marry those two, your voice, your values. And now let's go make some money. So you still have some freedom. So you can tell people, F no, I'm not doing that. I don't need to stay. And so it all blends in for me. That's awesome. There's a few different things in there I wanted to just touch on. One is, do you eat Brussels sprouts now? Yes, I do. I love them. (laughs) My mom is 94 and I've been taking care of her. And the other day she had some broccoli left on her plate and she wasn't going to eat it. And I'm like, mom, whatever happened to the clean plate club that she always subjected me to as a child. And then she was like, that was actually a mean thing to do. You realize. I also had a strong voice as a child. And I went through the years having a strong voice. And then I was in a relationship where it was like, you're too weird. You're too kooky. You're this, you're that. And so I suppressed my wackiness. And after getting out of that relationship, I'm happy to say I've been married now for a long time to someone who enjoys my wackiness. And I found my voice again. The third thing is that I actually just met with a bookkeeper the other day who works with women who are in the sex industry and are also dancers, erotic dancers. She's told me that they really feel like they have no understanding of their finances because no one will talk to them about it. That's right. Yeah. And that was really eye opening to me. And kudos for her that she sought out these people and she's helping them. Sex trafficking is a horrible thing, oh but God. I'm so yeah. glad that you've, you've been helping people out. And that's awesome. Yeah. It's funny you bring up dancers, strippers. I'm just going to call it what it is. Only fans, people who are sex workers. One of the things, because I'm a per- person of faith, I'm a Christian. One of the ways that in the past, And everybody does their thing based off of their personality, but people would go in the Christian faith and they would go in with like cookies and makeup into clubs as outreach. Like, here we go. When I got involved with the organization I'm involved with, I was like, guys, we need to talk the language of money, not the language of Jesus, the language of money. And then we could talk about Jesus. I'm like, and it's not antithetical to the Bible. Jesus met needs. He fed people. Then he was like, come to me. So it's the same thing. So I love to hear that. Strippers and exotic dancers, and they are money focused. When you come to them and you talk to them about how to, in slang terms, how to stack it and flip it, they understand that language. And they're a lot more open to that. So I love that she's doing that work. Hey there, this is Heather. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And if you are, if you wouldn't mind, please hit the subscribe button now. That way you'll never miss an episode. All right, now back to the podcast. 
Also on your site, you had a note on there that nearly 70% of business owners struggle with imposter syndrome. I know this is a common thing for both men and women, but women seem to fall prey of it quite a lot. Did you struggle with imposter syndrome? No. As a fellow eight, when we start to talk about the Enneagram, you've always known who you are. We just inherently know. But here's what I'm going to say. And this is where I have a little different twist on it. I'm not very woo. Okay. So I'm not like, oh, no one can be. There's enough out here for all of us. That's a syndrome. I'm like, no, some of you are freaking imposters. You are modeling what you see every other coach doing. You're modeling what you see every other dance studio owner doing. You're copying. It's not authentic to you. If it's not authentic to you, hello, boo-boo, you are an imposter. So I always tell people, I hope you overcome being an imposter because some of it is not a syndrome, sis, you are. Let's find the real you. And the Enneagram is a tool to help you find the real you. Oh, wow. This is a totally different take on imposter syndrome. I love it. The Enneagram is a personality test. There's other tests, and I love these, like the Myers-Briggs, the DISC. What is it about the Enneagram that's your favorite with helping your clients? Myers-Briggs is very common in corporate structures. Before I started owning my own business, I worked in HR for many moons. Myers-Briggs, I'm very familiar with it because it was a test we administered. DISC is very popular in multi-level marketing spaces, girly spaces, but they all do the same thing. Strength Finders is another one. Strength Finders is a good one because in the name, it tells you what it does. It helps you find your strengths. It's the same with DISC. It's the same with Myers-Briggs. So those tests are going to tell you, Heather, here's what you're really good at. And to maximize your goodness, put yourself in these types of environments. Make sure you do this type of work. It's really focused on your strengths. Conversely, the Enneagram is going to say, yeah, this is what you're really good at. But innately, you were formed this way. You weren't taught these things. There's the nature nurture thing that does come up. We talk a little bit about childhood woundings and stuff like that. But primarily, this is who you were formed very early in life, your innate strengths. But then, unlike these other tests, it's going to be like, and here's your shadow side. This is what you look like when you're under stress. In some Enneagram circles, they'll say healthy versus unhealthy. I don't like those words, especially when it comes to mental health. I don't think that those are helpful terms to use. So I will say aware, unaware, or integrated, unintegrated is my own spin on it. But there's a spectrum in terms of your awareness and how you're behaving. And the Enneagram shines a light on you. This is who you are. Not good and bad, but light and shadow in that way. After I said I wasn't woo, here I go talking about light and shadow. But it's the best way to explain it. And when you're empowered with those things about yourself, especially for those of us who are looking to lead teams, to scale our businesses, you have to know what you do really well and what you don't do well. And you need to learn appropriate vulnerability in leadership situations. And this is a tool to help you do that. Oh, can you explain that a little bit further? Yeah, it's one of the things that I'm sure somebody else is talking about it, but I'm the first person I've heard talk about it in this way, so I always claim it. But appropriate vulnerability. So Brene Brown, who doesn't love Brene? I want to be on your podcast. I love you, Brene. We love Brene Brown, right? She was the first in her shame research to come out and talk about vulnerability. So now every leadership book you pick up, ah, you got to be vulnerable. It's true. But again, when you have researchers who talk about things and not lame in practical terms, it's left up to the interpretation of the reader. And what I've seen in the vulnerability movement, especially from leadership, is low-key oversharing. It's emotional dumping. It's not appropriate vulnerability. People are like, I see, because I work with women in the beauty industry as well. So they come in and they want to tell their staff, revenue's down. 80% because of COVID. Me and my husband didn't have sex. We haven't had sex in three months because I'm so stressed out and my credit card bills are three months past due. I was really vulnerable with my staff today. I'm like, holy crap. That is not what Brene meant. What she meant was this. As an eight, I know that when I'm unaware, so when I'm just on autopilot, 
running strictly from instinct. When I get upset, I start to micromanage people. I will start to look over your back. I'm going to ask for a thousand reports. I'm going to ask for you to check in, check out. When I'm in the office, I'm going to be all over you. Appropriate vulnerability says to my team, this is not who I want to be. But when I get stressed, COVID related, you could use the example of that, COVID related or whatever, I can start to act like this. When you see me start to act like this, no, it's not about you. I also empower you to say, hey, you're going left. Help bring me into awareness. That's appropriate leadership vulnerability. You empower your team to know how to manage you, how to work with you. So it doesn't become personal. It becomes, we all got stuff we're dealing with. This is what Leslie's working through. Oh, I love that. And also it works both ways with your employees as well, so that you have a better understanding of where they're coming from because robots aren't working for us. That's right. That's so good, Heather. It does. It's such a powerful tool. It really helps teams get to understand that because we think everybody sees the world we see, the way we see the world. No, people see things differently. And it's just a tool that will help you recognize and appreciate the other people on your team and how we could both be looking at the exact same problem and seeing it completely differently. Hey, entrepreneur, are you stressing out over your cash flow? Are you always confused by your bank balance? Well, you know what? You're not alone. Lots of business owners struggle with this, but you don't have to. I'm Heather Zeitzwolf. Besides being a podcast host, I'm also a CPA. I can help you get your cash flow under control so that it's predictable and so you're profitable. Learn how by setting up a discovery call with me now. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes. All right, now back to the show. Through the Enneagram, can you discover what makes you different from your competition and can you leverage this somehow? Oh, for sure. For sure. I know off air, Heather, you told me that you are an eight. I'm an eight as well. Let's talk about how eights can use parts of their personality to make them a stronger salesperson because nothing happens until something's sold. I love sales gets me all hot and tingly. I love it. Money in the hands of women does great things in our world. I want women to have more money, period. I'm no bones about that. So as an eight, what do you care about? In the Enneagram, who you are is in three buckets. You have a core fear, you have a core desire, and you have a core longing. Okay. Tell me if it sounds familiar as an eight. Because here's the thing. I know you took a test. And this is why I say in inside of my Unshakable Leadership Program, we go through five weeks of this process because people are like, oh, I took a test. I know my number. First of all, the average test is only, even the best test out there are only about 60 to 70% accurate. And Heather, why would you think that would be the case? I would imagine that when people are taking the test, they're like, oh, that's not me. Or you want to think the best of yourself. So if it's going to be something negative, you're like, oh, I'm not going to answer that way that I'm not that person. But I guess the true test is when you look at the results and think, OK, that does sound like me. Yeah. Those tests are only as good as you are self-aware and things happen to you that impact your self-awareness. So this year I lost my mother. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is probably the biggest loss of my life. And so if I were to take an any, and I should do this just for giggles and research, just to take it now, would it impact my results? Because I'm under intense grief. Would it impact it? I know it will. So that happens too. It's not self-aware or maybe you're in a crisis and it impacts your results. So how do we overcome that so we can get to the real you and get to your real personality so we can leverage it? Is we go through a process to make sure that you try this on, you get some homework with it, you do some assignments and people do come out of it and say, I thought I was this, but I'm not. I need to try on another number. I don't think it's that. With that being said, but we're going to say eights though typically are very self-aware. And, and here's the funny thing about eights. Things that other people see as, oh, that's so embarrassing. That's not me. We're like, oh, yeah, that's me. That sounds right. <laughs> we see it as positive, like brash, short. We're like, good thing. No, that's not a good thing. <laughs> like to other people, they're like, eights are people who we don't get embarrassed by these sorts of things. What do I know about eights? Going back to the model, your core fear. Does it sound familiar? 
Eights are constantly worried that they're going to be betrayed. Oh, interesting. I, I would say that I, I don't really worry about that. But you know what? I think that I've dealt with that so much earlier in my life that I've come to the point where I feel like I can't really count on others. Like I can count on myself. So I don't rely on counting on others. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. That's the same thing, though. Oh, when you say that. I don't count on others because others will betray me. Others won't do what they say they're going to do. That's betrayal. The other thing is we hate to be controlled. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> As I sit here and look at your oranges, red hair, we hate to be controlled. If you tell an eight not to do something, they're probably going to do it. And people often think when they see the personality of an eight that I want to control you. I only want to control you as much as it keeps you from controlling me. I'm not trying to control you. I don't, I honestly, because here's another downside to the eight. We can honestly see people as dispensable. If you don't do it, somebody else will do it. And in leadership, that's a big thing. It's a big thing. And I had to overcome that through therapy and self-work. I would be like, I'll make another you. Okay, this person quits. All right, that's fine. We're moving on. And that doesn't make people feel all warm and fuzzy, Heather, and cared for. And people need to feel that way to grow. So as an eight, you don't want to be betrayed. You don't want to be controlled. And so your longing is, I'm safe. I'm protected. I'm in control. Your core emotion, though, always teeming under the surface is anger. Oh, really? Talk to me about your anger. If you're an eight, you feel anger. Do you feel like you feel anger? No, but maybe it's a hidden thing. I don't know. I'm not a very angry person, but I am very passionate about things. Maybe it comes out in a different way. Maybe it's not like yelling and screaming. I rarely ever do that. I usually keep that really controlled. When I was younger, I used to scream into a pillow, <laughs> but now I, I feel like I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, I don't think of myself as an angry person. Maybe it just manifests in a different way. Well, passion is definitely anger, typically. Passion, I always tell people, passion is anger directed. Oh. There's boundless anger, which is explosive, which is what came to your mind. I don't define it for people. If people tell me they're an eight, I ask them about anger and I let them go. So a lot of people think anger is explosive, going off, like fight. And that is my anger. Let's be very clear. My anger is I will fight you and feel good about it too. Afterwards, after I get it out, I'm like, hey, okay, I know I just went off, but did you want donuts? No, you don't want donuts. Like somebody's over in the corner crying and I'm like, so we're not going to dinner. Is that not happening? Because I've gotten it out and I've moved on. Remember when I talked about the wings? So every number, so there's nine numbers in the Enneagram model. Every person has a primary number. That doesn't mean you don't have these other numbers floating in you, but you have a primary number. Two numbers on the side are called your wings and they influence your personality. When you said the screaming in your pillow, so let me back up and explain this. And if your listeners want more, there are definitely resources to get more, but I think this is an important piece to understand about triads and where these numbers fit into the Enneagram. So there's nine numbers on the Enneagram and they're broken down into three triads. Head, heart, gut. Everyone who lives in the gut triad, the primary emotion is anger. Eights have a wing nine. That's still in the gut. Okay. That's still anger, but it's not explosive anger. Nines are asleep to their anger and they work very hard to keep things comfort, very comfortable for them because they, it's not worth the energy for them to do it. So their anger looks like resentment. Their anger looks like passive aggressive. Remember the shadow stuff because they work very hard not to display it. But there's some angry people, but it doesn't look like my anger because I'm like going on, pointing all the things. A nine will look like nothing's going on, but they're stewing. Huh. I would say that I, as far as anger goes, like I said, I don't go off on screaming and yelling, but I do understand people that are like that. And I can you know, let them go off on that and then be like, okay, that's all right. They were just showing their emotions and I'm over it. I don't need to dwell on that. You let it go. Yeah. Would you say peace is a priority for you? Yeah, I would say so. I'm all about fair, things being fair, letting people be themselves. And so if that's part of them being themselves, as long as they're not actually physically hurting somebody or being verbally abusive or something, but anger is just, we all react to things differently. And I understand if people need to vent. One of the things you said, Heather, too, is a primary advantage, if you will, or strength of an aid is justice. We love justice. Like we are for the underdog. We are for people using power appropriately. It's very common to see an eight 
integrated eight and aware eight, very involved in such social justice causes. People rumor that Martin Luther King was an eight. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. But again, in the Enneagram world, you don't type people by what you, because it's, we could have the same behavior, but have different motivation. But yeah, people who are nerded out in the Enneagram often think that Martin Luther King was an integrated eight. They also think that Donald Trump is an eight. So you got two wildly different personalities. One would say integrated, one is, would say not integrated. I don't think he's an eight. I think he's a counterphobic six, but that's a different conversation. How can a person utilize the Enneagram to know about their personality more and then turn this into a mechanism for helping them sell? One of the things that we've all heard, if you've been trying to sell anything, is that no one can be you and that's your secret sauce. It's no one's you, so no one can compete with you because no one can be you. The problem is, in the last four years of me coaching, I've found that a lot of people don't know who they are. And woman identifying folk, especially, I know as an eight, you're looking like, what the hell? How could people not know who they are? Like, I know who I was since I was two. But no, the, the other folk on the wheel have a tough time, especially when you put in social conditioning of what it looks like. Sometimes you've been lied to so much that you believe the lie. That shows up on test two. They don't really know who they are. It becomes very difficult to express what I stand for. There's a thing I call aspirational values. And I'm all about truth. I'm an eight. We have a BS meter. I'm like, I'm not here to play games with you. Stop playing games with yourself so we can move forward. That's the type of coach I am. I'm like, let's not play games. We're moving forward. People talk about values. And what happens, Heather, is people will start to do aspirational values. You get into it earlier on the test where people are like, no, that's not me. This is me. I'm going to pick that because that's what I should say, even though I could care less about integrity. That's a good word. I know it's a good word. Let me pick it. People do that. So when you start talking to them about values, you get all this aspirational stuff that's not really you. The Enneagram is going to say, no, boo-boo, this is what you really care about. Let's lean into those things. And that's when it becomes very easy to start to talk about things you care about. It becomes very easy to interject your personality, your angle into the conversation because it's coming from an innate place. This is truly who I am as opposed to some aspirational, this is what I should say place. So when you can say, this is who I am and put that out in a way, we're no longer chasing. I was getting ready to say something, but yours is a family friendly podcast. So I was trying to think of another way to say it. No, you can you can totally say it. OK, great. I don't chase dicks and I don't chase dollars. OK, both of those things come to me. I believe that you attract what you put out. So for me, I've never had to chase money. And I was a salesperson for many years. I've had coworkers say, that was the worst sales call ever. You acted like you didn't work with that person. I'm like, it wasn't an act. I didn't want to work with that person. But you got a quota to me. It won't be met with that person because I'm not going to compromise. I'm not chasing that dude. He wants me to kiss his butt. I'm not doing that. I'm going on to the next client. That's me leaning into my personality. I'm not chasing anything. But when you put out who you are, you really attract who you can serve. And when you attract who you serve, it's a joy to sell to them. And guess what? People pay more money. It's the no like trust factor. These are all buzzwords that we hear in the marketing sales space all the time. But no one's telling you, how do you get people to know you so that they can like you and then they can trust you? You have to be able to clearly articulate who you are. And I suppose you have to also know who you are. That's part of what the Enneagram will shed a light on for you. Yeah, you can't articulate what you don't know. You have to be honest when you're taking the test to utilize this tool. Or you need to sign up for me and coach with me for five weeks. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's talk about that. And we'll walk you through it and we'll make sure. But yeah, no, in, in all truthfulness, yeah, you need to be honest. But if you struggle with how to do that, that's what my program is all about. Yeah, let's talk about your program and how people can work with you. So I have a three-month intensive that I call Unshakable Leadership. And it all starts with before you can lead others, you must lead yourself. Self-awareness is the key to everything. But also I pull off of my years in owning a pole dance studio. Pleasure is very important to me, extremely important to me. It needs to be important to every woman in the world. 
It's your superpower. <laughs> I always say it's the thing that amplifies it. I basically have three pillars inside of my unshakable leadership in that three month program. The first is personality. We've talked about the Enneagram, but also pleasure. Your business needs to feel good. Your body needs to feel good. You need to be juiced up to do what we're going to do next, which is profit. So it's the three P's of it. It's personality, it's pleasure, it's profit. That is what's going to make you freaking unstoppable in your marketplace. Those three things. We go through the Enneagram, which is all about what we've talked about, mining out innately, truly who you are. So you will know who you are. We also go through pleasure practices. And I approach it from a standpoint of not a sexual way, but of in a way to get in touch with not instinct, but intuition. And a lot of times people confuse the two of those things. Pleasure is a gateway to your intuition. So you can learn, how do I express who I innately am in this situation? I need my intuition to do that. Pleasure practices connect you to that. And once you know who you are, how to communicate it, profits naturally happen. We start to blend how to be involved in conversations. Once you know those two things, You can interject in conversations in a way that's unique to you, call in those people, and that's going to help you make more money. Wow. (laughs) Very cool. One of the new things that we're trying out on this podcast is to kind of talk about the values that I have for the podcast and also for my business. And I thought I would just ask you quickly about some of these things and just get your feedback on that and see if any of these things resonate with you. I would love that. We've talked a bit about some of these things, but one of them is to be ethical, compassionate, speak up for what you believe in, make a positive impact on the world. Oh, that's such an eight statement. That's so good. You've already done this work, Heather. You don't need to pay me. You've done this work. That is such an eight statement. Oh, okay. Awesome. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Be passionate about learning. Information is power. Embrace data and technology to unlock and drive possibilities. Do you use technology to drive possibilities for you and your business? To drive possibilities? Somewhat. I'll tell you one thing I believe in that drives possibilities that comes through technology. I believe in behavioral segmentation from a marketing standpoint, especially like email marketing. I always used before it was cool, like in our industry, in the central movement industry, behavioral segmentation. I was doing that seven, eight years ago. And technology, there's so many convert kit, infusion soft, active campaign. All of these are behavioral segmentation email clients. So that's an example of how I see technology giving me the possibility to get the right message in front of the people at the right time so that they can make a buying decision. Yeah, that's really impactful. Okay, so another one is be disruptive and rebellious. Go against the status quo. Normal is boring and lacks imagination. Oh, I love that. An eight thing going against the status quo. We don't follow trends, we set them. Actually, we don't really care about trends, to tell you the truth. Think about it. Do you really care about trends? Not really. Exactly. We do what the F we want to do when we want to do it, baby. And if it happens to be trendy, great. If not, even better. I think you've nailed it, Heather. All right. So this is the last one. Be authentic. Be humble and thankful. Make real human connections. Own your mistakes and learn from them. Did you go through this process with somebody already? (laughs) Because these are so on target. No, I actually, I had a guest on. She is a purpose-driven marketer talking about how you really have to have your core values be solid so that way those can be implemented into your marketing. I was like, I should write down my core values. And then I came up with these. They have a lot to them. They're not just like one word. Here's what I was going to say is, again, core values and the Enneagram helps you understand what those core values are. But I'm going to step further and saying innate values. These are the things that are already in you because I don't want aspirational conversations. You have nailed it because here's the other thing about eights. Eights are gentle giants. So typically people experience you with a lot of confidence, a lot of bravado, a lot of her, right? A lot of, oh my goodness, she's got a lot going on. But what they don't understand is that we are extremely tender, extremely sensitive, and will do whatever you can. Like children and animals, eights need them in their lives in major ways. So your last statement tugs at the heart, because at the heart of an eight, under all of their is a big old teddy bear. Absolutely loves and cares and just wants people to be protected and not taken advantage of. 
Interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. I nailed it. That's awesome. You did. But I was going to say, I always say eights are probably the most self-aware. Cool. (laughs) I'm like, good stuff. Good work. That was worthy work. I'm glad you went through that. Leslie, this has been so awesome having you on the podcast. I could talk to you all day. Thank you for having me on. And if your listeners want to go deeper, if they want to learn more about the unshakable framework, they can find me, Leslie D. Lyons, my website. So LeslieDLyons.com. Or Instagram is where I live under the same Leslie D. Lyons. Awesome. Heather, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. And we'll have all that information in the show notes. Thank you so much. Hey, this is Heather. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. If you found value in the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave me a rating on iTunes or just simply tell a friend about it. And if you're interested in learning more about my profit advising and coaching, please set up a discovery call by using the link in the show notes. All right. Thanks so much and see you next time.